it's really a revolution against and on a rebel on the uh, sectarian uh, political class in, in, in Lebanon. <laughs> Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. This is our 900th program. We've been on weekly since 2003. Thanks to all who make this program possible. In our last few programs, we've mentioned the attacks on Rabbi Usherman as he tried to shield the Palestinians in rural places. Now, word comes that the settlers are resort, resorting to burning fields. These are pictures from the Israeli organization B'Tselem. It tweets, as in numerous previous incidents, the Israeli army not only failed to protect Palestinians, it fired at Palestinian residents who rushed to protect their property. This is what apartheid looks like. And this is a 16-year-old Palestinian youth, Saeed Yusuf Mohammed Odeh, who was shot to death by Israeli soldiers in a village near Nablus. Note that Defense of Children International Palestine states in its tweet that he was shot with two bullets in the back. The video you see here will not look so bad. There will be no blood or gore. But just at this point, the boy behind the counter wearing the hoodie is shot by an Israeli bullet and loses an eye forever. Gideon Levy writing in Haaretz explains that roadblocks and soldiers held up the injured child for hours until doctors had no alternative but to remove his eye. We assume you know that Israel's system is more and more seen as a variant of apartheid. It's shown recently in its medical apartheid. U.S. corporate media has spent a lot of time telling you how effective Israeli government authorities have been in spreading vaccine among the population. But it's a lie. The vaccine is going to Israeli citizens, not to the people the Israelis consider terrorists. That is, all the Palestinians living on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Only 3% of them have been vaccinated. Read about it on our site, thestruggle.org. We link to an editorial written by Israel's paper of record Haaretz. We record the day before this upcoming event. We have three versions of the poster. The first with the despots, the second with the despots squashed by our speakers, and the third one with just the speakers. The topic of the online panel is supporters of despots don't belong in left spaces. It's all about learning how to defend yourself from the self-styled leftists who say that the only people who deserve our solidarity are those who fight U.S. government imperialism. Anyone else, they say, is a regime change agent of U.S. imperialism. We'll explore this nonsense Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Go to rpm.world to find out how to view it. And if you miss it live, the program will be on Facebook and YouTube for a long time. And it's not merely a conflict of ideas. Listen to an interview I did with Palestinian Nidal Batare as he replies to the smears against a Lebanese man who was assassinated 
a few months ago. I'll be speaking to Nadal Batari, who is the managing director of the organization People Demand Change. He's Palestinian, raised in Yarmouk camp in Syria, and he worked for a time in Lebanon. He's written some outstanding articles about Syria and the Palestinians living there. We'll be speaking about his reaction to an article and podcast about an assassination, a Lebanese man named Lukman Slim. He's currently in Washington, D.C. Good morning, Nadal. Good morning. Thank you, Stanley, for giving me this uh, opportunity. Rania Khalik wrote an article called Lokman Slim's War, the Life and Mysterious Death of a Western Collaborator in Lebanon. You had an angry reaction uh, to that article on Twitter. Could we talk about it? Well, uh, yeah, actually, um, it's, it's sad like to, uh, to see this uh, smearing campaign which for me sounds and looks like a systematic campaign uh, uh, against uh, Lebanese activists in general, not only like uh, late uh, Lukman Slim, uh, because you know, there has been some protests and um, I would love to call it revolution in, in, in Lebanon in, in, the last, uh, in the last year, year and a half, uh, or maybe two years, um, that uh, it's really a revolution against and on a rebel on the uh, sectarian uh, political class in, in, in Lebanon, all of them, all of them, all sets, from Hezbollah uh, to Katayeb, uh, to uh, Kuwa, to, uh, to Aoun people, to uh, Durzi people, to like, it was like a popular, revolution and still actually uh, against this corrupt political class in Lebanon that has been ruling Lebanon since since 1945 basically never changed that the father dies and and the son uh, uh, inherits um, so you see this article as part of a kind of a counter-revolutionary uh, support for the system as it is. It is. It is. It is big time. It's like counter revolutionary. It is uh, in support to the the so called uh, uh, resistance axis um, because, like, basically the uh, the argument that Rania is building or built in that article and later in in the podcast that if you are not a pro Hezbollah. It means that you are a collaborator. This is as clear as this. This is the outline of it. Although she did not say that she is justifying, this is what she said literally. I am not justifying the murder or the killing of uh, of Lokman Steve, but he is a collaborator. So as if she's saying, "How dare you accuse Hezbollah and killing him?" But if they did, here is why. Um, yeah, Let me I ask mean, you, who, go ahead. Why do we care about what this person wrote? Who is Rania Khalik? Well, actually, I don't have a lot of uh, of information about her background. Like, but like from her name, I can tell that she has some uh, uh, like Arab origins, uh, maybe from Lebanon, from the Middle East somewhere. But uh, but what I know about her is that she is a journalist who is an Assad supporter uh, and she visited Syria and visited Bashar al-Assad in, uh, 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 in person. And I think she was the one, like this information needs to be verified, but I think she was the one who led a, a, uh, a delegate from, the, uh, from Congress with, uh, and, and took Tulsi Gabbard to, to, uh, to visit Syria. And then there was this a huge... Uh, uh, noise inside the, the Democratic Party here that Tulsi Gabbard visited Syria without uh, telling uh, uh, the leadership, the party here. 
Um, so in, and and she is part of a, a, a group uh, of journalists who keep going back and forth until today uh, between the United States and uh, and Syria, and their whole mission is to promote for the conspiracy uh, theory uh, against uh, against Bashar al-Assad, Hezbollah, and uh, and Iran in, in the region. He helped out in Syria. He was interested in prisoners and other things. He did an amazing job. It's like he did something no one ever thought to do before. Um, what he was working on basically is to meet former prisoners from Syria and ask them about the most common expressions and words that they were using while they were in the prison. So in other words, he was um, uh, establishing a dictionary about the, the expressions and words that been used in, in the prisons in Syria by, by prisoners them, themselves. Uh, I don't know if he finished this though, but this is something he worked very, 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 very hard uh, uh, on it. Um, and being like a Shia and criticizing Assad, Hezbollah, Iran, is something that I, I, I don't think that they will for him for this. For more of the interview, go to thestrugglevideo.org. Now, an exciting event that took place in New Haven, Connecticut, a May Day March for Immigrant Rights.
these are activists with Stop Solitary Connecticut speaking to legislators about SB 1059, a bill that would basically end solitary confinement in the state. And now to my interview on the subject. I'll be speaking to Barbara Fair, a longtime ad activist on prison issues and the lead organizer of Stop Solitary Connecticut. We'll be speaking of about a possible roadblock on what is an exciting bill, an exciting law that would eliminate solitary confinement as we know it. And one that has a good number of influential sponsors among the political leaders. Good afternoon. Hi, how are you, Stan? Good, good. So what is the name and number of the bill in question? It's Senate Bill 1059. Um, Senator Winfield uh, is the sponsor, mm -hmm. and so far we have 29 co-sponsors. We're That's very great. excited watching that, that list grow. And, and is it named uh, the PROTECT Act? Uh, yes, that's what we call it, the PROTECT Act. Okay, good. So if people call their uh, legislators, they can if they forget the number, they could say that. And, and yes, to protect that. Yeah, that. Most, most legislators, uh, I'm, I'm assuming all probably should know it by now. All right, so let's start with the news, the possible problem. Of what is a, a fiscal note and what is it saying? A uh, fiscal note is what, um, say, Department of Corrections, we're asking them to do some work. And so what they do, they'll put together uh, some kind of a budget and they'll send that to appropriations and said, this is what it costs to do what this bill, this piece of legislation wants us to do. And so they put together a, a bill and appropriation looks it over to get some kind of accounting on how much it's gonna cost to do the work that we're asking them to do. And it was quite a piece of change, right? Yes, uh, you know, when we go by the Department of Corrections, they're saying it's gonna be, um, $15.1 million that it's going to cost. And no, no, sorry. We're, we're saying that they actually save $15.1 million. But um, the Department of Corrections is saying it's going to cost $18.3 million to $21.4 million um, for the fiscal year um, 2022. So they, they say, well, there'll have to be more uh personnel and maybe more construction and stuff like that. But I took a look at the note, I, I'm not an expert on it, but it didn't talk about that it would save anything if you got rid of uh, some of the onerous uh, solitary confinement. Right, they don't talk about that, but just the facts like um, solitary confinement goes on in a lot of the prisons, but just the fact they're closing down Northern, which is a supermax, Mm -hmm. That and alone is, is saving 17.5 million. Now, of course, a lot of that money is staff. And so those staff are not going to just, you know, leave the job. They're going to go into other facilities. So we can't say just uh, closing Northern is really saving all, um, all that money. And, and, and the, I think the biggest part of the fiscal note that the Department of Corrections put together, which is what we're going to be responding to um, at our press conference, is, is the fact that they're saying they have to hire uh, between 45 and I think 60 um, more correctional officers to be able to do this work. When the reality is the, um, the Department of Corrections um, staff have been over way over the, na the national average. And so, and then with um, decarceration in, in our minds, we're gonna have an even lower prison staff, I mean, uh, incarcerated staff. So we won't need more people, we'll need less people as we stop incarcerating so many people. And if there's less people uh, suffering this, uh... Uh, solitary confinement, I would assume there would be less problems in prisons. Definitely. And we talk about the financial cost, but the 
the um, the psychological toll of putting people in isolation like this for 22, 23 hours a day. And that's not even talking about the, the abuse that goes along, along with it, like putting people in cages and chaining them up um, like 23 hours a day and in a position where they can't even sit up straight. So all that abuse is going on, those are leaving scars on those people. And, and, and if anything, it makes them more dangerous because they're more angry, they'll be more violent, they'll be antisocial. So when you just think of the psychological costs to our communities at these people coming back to our community in that shape, we can't even put a price tag on that. Right. So what, uh, what does it change uh, about uh, the rules of solitary confinement? It, it, ne it doesn't say that you can never put a prisoner by himself for any length of time, but what does it say? Right, what we're trying to do is uh, follow the international Mandela rules, which say uh, torture is having someone in um, a cell for 22 hours a day. And so what we'll do, what we're asking for is to at least follow, and these are the minimum standards, 22 hours a day. And so no one should be in for 23 hours a day, that's actual torture according to um, United Nations. So we're saying that torture has to end, um, shackling people inside of their cell has to end, the, um, the random abuse has to end, and that people have to be treated in a more humane manner. And we're asking that all of these facilities that hold people for 22, 23 hours a day need to let people out so uh, it'll look more like we're rehabilitating people as opposed to just simply warehousing them. Now, I'm sure you must have heard people complain that you want to treat hardened criminals with kid gloves. They would take advantage and make chaos out of a prison. What do you say to that? Well, people will always come to those uh, outrageous stories and, and, and make a broad brush like this is what prison is like. The majority of people in prison are not in, not these violent rapists, murderers. That's that's not who's filling our prisons. Many of our prisons are filled with people who have addiction problems, who have um, mental health problems. Um, they have drug offenses. That's what the bulk of our prison system is. Now, when you put them in these conditions and send them back out into the community after you've abused them. Yes, now you're going to have more violent offenders because this is what you produced. You produced these monsters. And so um, that's how they justify, you know, doing the stuff that they do. But no, most of the people in there are not these violent offenders. We're not saying treat them with, with uh, kids' gloves. We're saying treat them humanely. If we have any humanity, we need to be treating people with that humanity or we, we lose our own. Now, the law refers to something called ombuds. What's that? That's because we know that systems like this that don't have oversight tend to, you know, their power just gets crazy. Just They just do all kinds of things because no one's looking. So we want to have an ombudsman, which we had in Connecticut, and it ended, I think, around 2007, 2009, claimed by budget. But we need to have that because without that, the prisons are just out of control. The, the abuse is out of control. And so if we have somebody independent of the system that's, that can come in and talk to the incarcerated people, um, check out any claims, the complaints they have, and try to reconcile them with the Department of Corrections, that will go a long ways in the millions, and I mean multi-millions of dollars in lawsuits that Department of Corrections uh, has to pay out, which is our state. Um, taxpayers have to pay out because of the harm they've done to others. And I saw one thing about letters and phone calls that I thought was pretty, pretty cool in that, uh, you know, you read these stories about prisoners having to pay enormous amounts of money to make a phone call or get a stamp or something like that. What does the law say about that? Well, actually, this session, it looks like we're going to have a bill um, not, it's not our bill, but uh, there's another bill that's going to provide free phone calls. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to happen, but, mm -hmm. uh, for me, like when we have public hearings around the, uh, the enormous amount of money people spend on, uh, phone calls, it's in the, the state is benefiting millions of dollars every year. 
And that doesn't go back into the communities and doesn't go to help the, the incarcerated people. It actually helps with, um, say, telecommunications uh, for state workers. And so with all that money being, and, and it also pays for us like probation officers, parole officers, things that the poorest people in the, in the system should not be uh, responsible for paying for those and things. And then they can't contact their families and no. that kind of good reinforcement. Right. And then on top of that, when they get out of prison, should they be fortunate enough to, uh, you know, win a lottery or something or get um, some, uh, maybe some inheritance, the state will send them a bill for their incarceration at the, I think the rate now is $200 a day that they pay for that. They have, they put a lien against anything, lawsuits, anything that they may get, they put a lien against them for $200 a day. And, and imagine that if you've been abused and caged like an animal, that they actually charge you $200 a day for that, that treatment. Well, final question. Um, if people want to support this bill and help win its passage, what can they do? Well, uh, a lot of that's been going on is, is writing your email and your legislator, um, making calls, especially calls, because uh, if you can get the personal numbers, that, that's most beneficial because, you know, the state's been closed down. So it's The fight against the killingly climate death factory is still going on, as shown by these local folks opposed to a second fracked gas plant in their eastern Connecticut town. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.